So we talked about operons, and now we're gonna start talking, switch gears. We talked about recombination, right? Operons and recombination, recombinants. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about mutations. And we'll talk about how these organisms fix mutations. And that would basically be it for this chapter. We're talking about genetic mutations, uh, defects or changes at the DNA level. A, an organism that has the correct sequence of a gene is said to be the wild type organism. So the sequence is the right sequence. It's the one that works. It's the wild type strain. But if you have a mutation in that DNA, then you become the mutant strain. So a microorganism with a, with a change in the gene is now going to be referred to as the mutant strain. So this is pretty straightforward. Just words here. Now the discussion shifts gears and asks this question, how? How do mutations come about? Well, in one way, they are spontaneous. They happen spontaneously. Well, there's nothing really spontaneous about anything. There's a, there's a reason behind it. The whole idea is that during DNA replication, the enzyme involved in DNA replication is very good at what it does. DNA polymerase three knows what it's doing. It copies the DNA and usually does it correctly. And it's copying it so fast that sometimes it does make a mistake and it overshoots the mistake. So it's like A, G, C, T, G, C, T, G, C, T, mistake, G, C, T, G, C, T, and then stops and realizes, I just made a mistake. And it backtracks, it says, okay, break it down, break it down, break it down, fix it, then start building again. It is very good at doing that. So it has what we call proofreading capabilities. It corrects its own mistakes. It's similar to what you would do before you hand something in to me. I gotta correct this before I give it to him so he doesn't mark it off. <coughs> so I don't suffer the consequences of that. Well, the consequence of this could potentially be for us cancer. So you want your DNA polymerase three to fix, to fix its own mistakes. That's a good thing. But again, once in a while, DNA polymerase three, when it's doing the, it, it actually makes a mistake and doesn't realize I just made a mistake. So it overshoots it and it keeps going. So now you have the potential of having cancer, unfortunately, because it made a mistake that it did not proofread. Yeah, nobody's perfect. DNA polymerase 3 is pretty good at what it does, but once in a while, it does make a mistake that it does not correct. Now that is called a spontaneous mutation, typically happening during DNA replication. Who's causing it? A mistake by DNA polymerase 3. Can we induce mutations in the lab? Yes, we can, you did it. When you put the plate under UV, that's what you were doing. You were inducing a mutation at the DNA level. You can do it using ultraviolet light like we did in the lab, you can do it with more powerful forms of radiation, like X-rays and gamma rays, those are powerful. <coughs> These typically actually kill the organism. That's how powerful they are. They can, you can also do it with chemicals called mutagens. Now, you don't have to memorize this list. So there are some chemicals, and they would be labeled on the bottle, for example, uh, mutagen, carcinogen, so handle with care and all that. So there is a procedure that is used in the lab to figure out which chemical is a mutagen. I mean, how do they figure that out? Of course, it's through experimentation. Listen, please. This one can be a little bit involved if you're not listening, but if you listen to me, you'll be fine. The Ames test is designed to have two plates, a control plate and a test plate or experimental plate. Both plates are exactly the same, with the one exception. This plate will have the chemical that you're testing. 
See, the whole idea is to test. For example, does ethidium bromide cause genetic mutation? So you would put ethidium bromide on that plate. Besides that, everything else is the same between the two plates. The only difference between the two is this one will have the test chemical, this one will not. The key important thing for you to know is both plates are histidine minus. That means they do not have one of the important 20 amino acids, histidine. We intentionally make media that does not have any source of histidine in it. One of the 20 amino acids. So if you throw bacteria on this plate without histidine, it will die because I've never met a bacteria that said no to histidine because it needs histidine to build proteins. It's one of the 20 amino acids. Bacteria needs histidine to make proteins. You need histidine to make proteins too. You're no different than that. So we intentionally put bacteria on here without histidine in the media. On top of that, listen to it. The bacteria itself cannot make its own histidine. So it has a defect, making it histidine minus. So it, it does not even have the capability of making histidine. So it doesn't make histidine. The bacteria, in this case Salmonella, is histidine minus. That means it has no capability of making histidine. So for it to survive, I must give it histidine. But I'm not. Okay? Now, it is growing in this culture tube initially. Now, this culture tube most likely will have histidine in there because you want to grow it. The idea is that you're going to take an inoculum from here and put it on this plate. The inoculum on this plate will die because it doesn't have the ability to make its own histidine. That means you have to give it to me, and I'm not giving it to, to the bacteria. So it will die because it won't be able to make proteins. And whatever I'm doing with this one, I'm also doing with this one. So this plate is also histidine minus. The interesting thing is, when I put the bacteria on this plate, it does grow. On this plate, ignore these for now. On this plate, it dies. But remember what was the difference between the two plates? the test agent. agent chemical. So here's the idea now. You're testing to see if the chemical is a carcinogen or is a mutagen. Does it mutate DNA? Well, if it does mutate DNA and I put it on this plate and then I grow bacteria on here that does not have the capability of making histidine, there's a chance that the chemical will mutate the bacteria so that it now makes histidine if the chemical is a mutagen. Are we catching that? If the chemical causes genetic mutations, then there's a very good chance that it will mutate the bacteria from histidine minus to histidine positive. It says, I don't need you to give me histidine anymore. I can make my own now. That's why they're growing. The reason why these guys ended up growing on this plate is because the test chemical mutated the bacteria to make them histidine positive. They now can make their own histidine and grow just fine. So once I see colonies on this plate, I get this idea that, oh, that's a mutagen. The chemical, the test agent, is a mutagen. Because there's no way these colonies would grow unless they're mutated to become histidine positive. Who mutated them? The test chemical. Now most of the bacteria that you put on here will actually die because they will not get mutated. Now the problem is now, some students pick up on this and they ask me this question, why are there colonies on here? The reason why we have colonies on here 
is because of something called back mutation, meaning that by random chance, spontaneous mutation, by random chance and by random chance alone, the bacteria mutated back to be his positive. So these are living organisms. Some of them on their own will mutate to become his positive. So the idea is not to look at, oh, look at that one colony, then no, I might be wrong. No, you have to look at the stimulation between the two. You cannot run this experiment without the control plate. You can't do it. So at the end of the experiment, you have to compare the two plates. So let's say this plate had 100 colonies. This plate had four. Look at the difference. 100 versus 4, that means the chemical agent caused 96 more colonies to be produced compared to the random spontaneous mutation. So you're looking at the difference in the numbers. If this was 10 and this was 12, then I will say the chemical agent is not a mutagen. But if this is 200 and this is 2, then it's a mutagen. It stimulated it. Are we catching that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Questions before I change the slide? This is a commonly uh, performed test to assay those chemicals if they're mutagens or not. So you're looking for the stimulation between the two. So you have to run this in tandem to get an idea is what are the number of colonies that just by chance revert to his positive? and compare that to this. If you see stimulation in the numbers, that means a greater number in this plate than this one, significantly greater. That tells you that the agent is the one that caused this mutation. Very clever test there. There are both positive and negative effects of mutations. I mean, I know that every time somebody thinks of a genetic mutation, you think, oh, that's bad. I know, because that's what you hear on the 6 o'clock news. You always hear the bad news. But there are some mutations that are actually good for you. They allow you to adapt, evolve. So not all mutations are bad. There are some mutations, actually, they simply mark you for who you are. That's it. They don't do anything to your proteins. So there are different kinds of mutations, more like different kinds of effects that mutations can have. See, the mutation is happening at the DNA level. But the effect is going to happen at the protein level. So in some cases, you may have a genetic mutation at the DNA level that does nothing to your transcription and translation. The protein is exactly the same. Those you don't have to worry about because they're called silent mutations. Those are the ones you say, okay, if I have to have a mutation, I want one of those because they do nothing. Hence the word silent mutation. They mark you for who you are. That's it. If you leave your DNA sample, I'll be able to identify you from that. But that's it. They don't hurt you in any way whatsoever. They don't benefit you, and they don't hurt you. They're called silent mutations. The, the, the change is still at the DNA level. It just happens in an area where it doesn't do anything for you or to you. But then you have these kinds. Again, the, the defect is at the DNA level, but the effect you'll feel at the protein level. Missense mutation is, for example, taking one amino acid and saying, no, no, I don't want proline, I'm gonna put valine instead. Now we have a problem. That's an amino acid substitution. You take one amino acid out and replace it with another one. What's the consequence of that? It all depends on which protein are you talking about? Which change are you talking about? Where in the protein are you making that change and all that stuff? And what does the protein do? When does it do it? And uh, so many layers of... Uh, but I'll give you a very good example. Sickle cell anemia is caused by a single 
amino acid substitution. And it is a devastating disease. Devastating. Just one amino acid is different. That's all. And it's devastating. So they can be quite devastating. Just, and that, those are called missensed mutations when you're actually changing the amino acid. Then you got another kind called nonsense mutation. That's when you introduce a new stock codon. So watch this. Look up here, please. Let's say this is your mRNA. It starts here and it stops here. So the stop codon is right here. So this is the full length of your protein from here to here. A genetic mutation happens to introduce the stop codon here. So normally the stop codon is here. Now it's here. So let's say this is the catalase gene. This is catalase from here to here. That's what's going to break down your hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. This is part of catalase. It will do nothing because it's not catalase. Catalase is the full protein. This is not catalase. This is just part of it. I'll tell you something. Your car has four wheels, a steering wheel, seats, a hood, doors, and that's a, a complete car. Imagine if you buy a car with one door, one wheel, and just the brakes. Then you don't have a car. You have part of a car. Don't go driving that one. It's not going to work for you. So nonsense mutations introduce early stop codons. Obviously, the earlier the stop codon, the worse off you are. Silent mutation we talked about. Back mutation are very interesting. Don't expect a back mutation to happen to me or you. Mutations in general are rare and random. I cannot tell my cell, I want a mutation right here. I wish I could, but I can't. Because I can manipulate things now, but I can't. It, they're random. And on top of that, thank God, they're rare. A back mutation would involve this. A specific nucleotide in your DNA mutated to be something bad and then mutated back to normal, the same nucleotide. Yeah, good luck waiting for that one. In you, that will, that will not happen because the random nature of mutation, the fact that mutation is rare, now you're asking me to mutate the same spot twice, one to make it bad and one to make it good again? Are you kidding me? You're asking a lot out of me unless you're bacteria. It happens all the time in bacteria. Can someone think of why would that be? If you're asking me to do back mutation, good luck waiting for that because I won't be able to do it because it's just me. But if you're dealing with bacteria, it happens all the time because of what? Think about it. There you go. Because of the fact that bacteria within three to five minutes, they multiply. Three to five more minutes, multiply, multiply, multiply. You did the numbers. You went from 500 colonies three hours later, five million of them, whatever. They multiply really fast. So each single bacterium has a very small chance of a back mutation. But you're not dealing with a single bacterium, you're dealing with millions of them. You see that? In the culture flask or tube, there's not just one bacteria in there, there are millions of them. And the chance of a back mutation in each one of them adds up to make it to the point where, oh yeah, for sure it's gonna happen. You see that? When you look inside the culture tube, you say, I know for a fact it will happen because we're dealing with bacteria. But for me, I don't multiply like that. Neither do you. 
So if you're paying attention to the slides, when we talked about the Ames test, how did these come about? Not from the chemical agent. They came about from spontaneous back mutation. I mean, they're gonna be rare, but they will happen in bacteria. Obviously, it happened in this one. So some of these colonies will also be from the spontaneous back mutation, maybe equivalent like four colonies, like there are four colonies here. Maybe four of these colonies are also from back mutation, but the rest of them are from what? See? The chemical agent. So in bacteria, because of how bacteria multiplies by binary fission, it gets to a point where a back mutation is almost guaranteed to happen. Then you have one of the worst ones, frame shift mutation. A frame shift mutation is produced as a result of DNA, a nucleotide deletion or a nucleotide insertion. So the initial mutation is that it's still at the DNA level. Of course, the protein is the one that feels the effect. So during DNA replication, for some reason, the enzyme DNA polymerase 3 missed copying this G. So the new DNA has a deletion. Or by mistake, added an extra G. So the new DNA has an insertion. So this is the normal sequence of the G. Obviously this one has this G missing. This one has an additional G before this C. So that's a deletion, that's an insertion. So what happens as a result of that is when the ribosome starts reading the three codon, three base codons, the normal sequence or frame is this, AUG, methionine, ACC, threonine, GAC, aspartic acid, GAG, glutamic acid, methionine, lysine. That's called the reading frame. But then when you lose a nucleotide, it shifts the frame. The frame initially starts out okay. AUG, methionine. But then instead of ACC, this C, which is the G on the DNA, is now gone. So the ribosome says, A, C, what happened to that C? It's gone. Okay, can I borrow the G from you? Can I borrow this G from you? And now it's gonna read A, C, G. And then everything after that shifts by one nucleotide. Interestingly, A, C, C and A, C, G happens to code for the same amino acid because the third nucleotide of that base is called the wobble position, the whatever position. AC, whatever, will give you three in it. So it's called the wobble position. I also call it the wild card position. So there are some amino acids that are coded for like that. The, the DNA, the genetic code is said to be degenerate. Um, sorry, uh, redundant or degenerate, it's the same thing. Redundant means multiple codons give you the same amino acid. And it's because of the wobble position. So in some amino acids, AC, whatever, will give you the same amino acid. So it happens that these, even though there was a frame shift, it still gave you the same amino acid. That's fine. But then you go to the next one, you're supposed to have aspartic acid. Now you have threonine. You're supposed to have glutamic acid. Now you have arginine. You're supposed to have methionine. Now you have an early stop codon too. It messes everything up. From the point of deletion on, you can literally have a completely different protein. The same thing happens with insurgents. You put a nucleotide in there, from this point on, the frame shifts. So you can also have a completely different sequence of protein after that. Is Tay-Sachs the only thing that's similar? Say again? Is Tay-Sachs the only thing? From frame shift, shift? Oh, there's so many. So many, yeah. Different kinds of diseases that are caused by that. So, of course, our cells 
are not gonna just sit there and take a genetic mutation and accept it. They're gonna try their best to fix these mutations. The best time to fix a genetic mutation is at the time of DNA polymerase making it. See, DNA polymerase makes a genetic mutation by mistake, makes a mistake, and it goes right away and fixes it. That's the best time. See, the best time to fix a, a broken wall is when you're building it, you see? But sometimes, again, DNA polymerase 3 goes through, makes a mistake, doesn't realize it, and moves on. Luckily, we have the supervisors. The supervisors that come and check DNA polymerase 3's work. So let's pretend we're building a brick wall and we want red bricks. And DNA polymerase 3, by mistake, puts in a yellow brick. So the whole wall is made up of red bricks, except for one yellow brick. The easiest thing to do is to do this one, called mismatch repair. As a supervisor, you walk through and you look at the new brick wall, checking DNA polymerase 3's work, and you're, oh, what's that yellow brick doing there? Okay, let me take the yellow brick out and replace it with a red one. Done, job done. That is called mismatch repair. A is complementary to what? T. T. What if, by mistake, you realize that A is binding with G? Now that's a mistake. The simplest thing to do is remove the nucleotide and replace it with the correct one. That's mismatch repair. So that's one approach. Take the bad, or take the mismatch out and change it with the correct one. But then sometimes, Sometimes you are forced to do this. You check the brick wall and you realize there was a yellow brick in the middle of all the red ones and you decide to go crazy with it. I'm not gonna remove the brick alone. No, no, I'm gonna break the whole segment around it. Remove this whole piece and replace it with a brand new one. That's called excision repair. So I'm gonna demonstrate this for you on here. And there are four enzymes involved. You need to know them. You need to know their names, what they do, and their order of appearance. So you have double-stranded DNA. They're all, of course, hydrogen bonding. There's hydrogen bonding between the strands. And right here, there's a genetic mutation. Don't worry about how that was introduced. It's okay. The first enzyme that comes in play is an enzyme called endonuclease. Endonuclease. This enzyme will live up to its name. It's an enzyme that cuts nucleic acids. Nuclease. Internally, endo. This is opposite what another enzyme would do, something, uh, you don't need to know this one, exonuclease would break the DNA from the outside, from the edges in. Exonuclease will chop the DNA this way. Don't worry about that one. Endonuclease will cleave the DNA right in the middle around the mutation. So it's gonna do this. The dotted lines are the hydrogen bond. So what it do is broke phosphodiester bond here and a phosphodiester bond here. All right. But that does not release that broken piece. So you need another enzyme that breaks the hydrogen bonds. Which enzyme would that be from DNA replication? Which enzyme unzip the DNA by breaking the hydrogen bonds? Helicase. So helicase will come in and remove the hydrogen bonds. So it will look like this. It's gone. The mutation is still here. 
So do you agree that nothing is holding this piece anymore? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was held here by phosphodiester bonds and you cleaved those. It was held here by hydrogen bonds and you got rid of those. So there's nothing holding this broken piece anymore. So it leaves. So now you will have this. It's gone. Another enzyme will come in and say, I can't leave this like that. I gotta fill that gap. DNA, polymerase, it's not who you think. Polymerase, it's actually polymerase one, not three. Watch out for that. It is DNA polymerase one. It will come in and bind and it will make DNA. <coughs> Once DNA polymerase one is done, now your DNA will look like this. It will be completely done, hopefully fixed, but it will not have that final phosphodiester. So there's another enzyme that seals the gaps. Which one is that? Ligase. DNA ligase. DNA ligase will come in here and seal that gap, and at the end, you're gonna have hopefully a fixed DNA, hydrogen bonded, everything is good. So the four enzymes are endonuclease comes in, cuts the two phosphodiester links. Helicase comes in, removes the hydrogen bonds. That broken piece will now fall out. DNA polymerase one will come in, fill in that piece of DNA, except for that, pho that last phosphodiester link. That is done with DNA ligase. Are we okay with that? Are we good? Okay, this is called, in bacteria, in us, we just call it excision repair, but in bacteria, they call it excision repair or dark repair. Because it happens whether you have the light on or not, who cares? This is the reason why they call it dark repair in bacteria to contrast it with the next one that we're gonna talk about is photoreactivation. Photoreactivation is also called light repair. See that? We don't have photoreactivation. We have remnants of it, but it doesn't work for us anymore. Some bacteria have the ability to fix broken DNA or damaged DNA with another whole new mechanism they're called photoreactivation. Obviously it needs light. Which part of that word tells you that it needs light? Photo. The photo part, yeah. So I'm gonna describe this here, but before I do, it's on the video. So before I do, I have to explain to you something and then we'll go from there and then we'll finish this part. I have to explain to you how UV damages DNA. Because photoreactivation is usually going to be used for fixing UV damaged DNA. The way what I'm about to tell you right now happens in bacteria exposed to UV, and it will also happen to you sitting on the beach. You have DNA. Actually, I'm going to write a sequence. For example, A, G, C, G, T, T, A, G, C, T, for example, that means this is T, C, G, right? C, A, A, am I right? T, what? C, G, A, good. All of these are phosphodiester bonded. And all of these are hydrogen bonded. Am I right? Good. And if this is five prime, this is 
If this is three prime, this is five prime, this is anti-parallel. Oh, good, we, we're familiar with that, hopefully. So this is you going to the beach, sitting on the beach there, whatever, two hours later, eventually, the UV hits your DNA and decides, I want these two to covalently bond with each other. That would be abnormal. Yeah. Is that done with a long-term cell? Say? Is it done with a long-term cell? Long? Long-term cell? Langer hand? Langer hand. Langer hand? Yeah. Now it can happen to any of your cells, any of your skin cells, and any DNA exposed to UV this can happen to it. So most likely it's going to be your skin cells because that's what's going to be most likely exposed to the sun. Okay. So. so when you put the bacteria in that chamber, the UV chamber, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. That's what you were doing. You were, it's no, you're no different. When you put the bacteria on the plate and then you put it in your, the UV box, that's exactly the same as you sitting on, at the beach getting a suntan. There's no difference. The UV damages bacterial DNA the same way it will damage our DNA. It causes thymidine dimers. This is not a normal thing. So it's called a TT dimer, and T is thymidine. So it causes a thymidine dimer, or dimerization of the thymidine. Now, thymidine is a pyrimidine. I'm telling you, you need to know all this information to understand what I'm saying here. Um, pure as gold, so that means adenine and guanine are purines. But C and T are pyrimidines. So you can call this a thymidine <coughs> dimer, to be specific, to the fact that it's a TT dimer. Or you can be a little bit more general and call it a pyrimidine dimer because a thymidine is a pyrimidine. But there are two other dimers that can be that can that are possible. Well, C is a pyrimidine, so CC can dimerize too. What's the other combination? TT, CC. No, G is a purine. A, a is a purine. C, C. C T. Mm. These three are the possible ones. Nice exam question coming up. This, however, is the most common kind, type. Did you catch the reference to the exam? T T is the most common type of pyrimidine dimer. Whether it's a TT dimer, a CC dimer, or a CT dimer, that is abnormal. Your DNA replication machinery, when it goes up against this, it doesn't know what to do with that. So you'd be in extreme trouble at this point. In bacteria, they have this interesting mechanism in at least some bacteria. When you shine regular light on them, it activates a gene that co produces an enzyme co called photolyase. The enzyme is called photolyase. Photolyase is like this eraser right here. Light, gene expression, photolyase. Sounds good? Watch this. Look how it works. What is that? That's not good. That's not good. We don't want that. Erase it. We're done. Did you see how, how, how it did it? Did I change anything? No. no. In excision repair, I said, what's that yellow brick doing there? I'm going to take out the yellow brick, put in the red brick. Am I right? Mm -hmm. In excision, sorry, in, uh, in mismatch repair, I did that. Mismatch repair. Mismatch repair. Take out the yellow brick, replace it with the red one, right? In excision repair, I took out the whole piece, right? Replaced it with a new piece. That's not what I did with photoreactivation. All I did was... Resolve the dimer. That's it. Erase the mistake. I did not change anything. I just resolved the dimer. So photolyase simply resolves the dimer. 
it does not need to take out and replace anything. It's sort of like you catching a mistake on your hand or whatever, something that you're going to hand out to me, and you realize, oh no, I don't need that E, we're done. You didn't have to take out anything or replace anything, you just erased your mistake, that's it. So what we did in the lab, and what you guys are going to analyze on Tuesday, is that we exposed our bacteria to UV. And we're going to ask the question, and you're going to get the answer for it on Tuesday, which one, which of the four bacterial species that we put on that plate has the ability to fix the damage? The ones that can fix the UV damage will survive to live another day. They will grow on your plate. The ones that cannot will die. But that's also a factor of how long we expose the bacteria to the UV. Think about it. You go to the beach, you sit for five minutes, and then you go home. And you look in the mirror like, nothing happened, I did not change color because you only sat for five minutes versus three hours. That will change your color, right? It's a matter of exposure time. That's why we did one minute, three minutes, five minutes. Five minutes of UV for a bacteria is a lot of UV. You'll see that at least one, maybe two of them, will survive that level of radiation. Which ones? The ones that are able to do this. The ones that are able to fix the damage. So we'll see that on um, Tuesday.